So welcome back, everyone. So uh, I'm going to sit down for a moment because it's easier for me to type. Um, actually, maybe that's it. And then let me let me walk a little bit, and then I can then I'll get back to to this. So first, we're going to do cardinality constraints, and we're going to do the CDCLT that I've shown you before, where we have uh, the the SAT solver on one end. So this is the SAT solver. Uh, running CDCL, and then on the other end we'll have the theory solver, um, and here we're going to do cardinality constraints. So cardinality constraints are quite easy. It's something like um, A plus B plus not C is smaller or equal to 1, for example. So this means that out of these three literals, at m most one of them must be true. OK? And uh, basically what will happen is that you will have a set of cardinality constraints. So this is the cardinality constraint input. And you have the SAT solver obviously has the CNF input because that's what it, it understands. And basically the SAT solver will be running on its own without any cardinality stuff going on. But it will be calling your cardinality uh, solver, uh, theory solver, and asking you, is this assignment OK? Is this assignment OK? For example, it will set A to 1 and B to 1, and then you're like, no, this is not OK. And the reason why it's not OK is because both of them are set to 1. So you tell them, hey, no, it's not OK. One of them must be, must be 0, right? So this is the reason. This is wrong. I flip everything and I say that's the reason why. So I give this back as a reason. This is my reason. This is a reason for the conflict. Okay? This is my conflict clause. And it's the reason, and of course, this, this means that, that the current assignment of both of them being one is wrong. So this is the kind of stuff you'll have to implement. And I'll explain, I'll show you how and, and where. So, I have implemented this into CryptoMinisat, and it's basically running a Python file. I'll show you it in a second. Here we go. So if you have done that Docker pool, whatever, then soon you will be able to do the following. In a second, I'll explain what you need to do. I just want to show this for a moment. So this is the command line you'll have to run, but it's very, like, you just copy-paste it. Obviously, nobody types this thing in. You run it. Oh, it's a little... Uh, it's unsatisfiable. All right. So what happened here? So this was the set of variables that uh, the current assignment that the uh, theory solver was given. Okay. And it said, well, I'm going to examine all the all the all the constraints that I have. So these are the, the the four constraints that I have. Variable 10 plus variable 11 must be less than or equal to one. Not variable 10 plus variable 11 must be less than or equal to 1, et cetera. Okay? So these are the four cardinality constraints that I have. It examined all of it and says, nothing to do, I return 0. And, and then it's going to say, OK, well, you know, like the, the solver did something. It said 11 to minus 1. What's going to happen now? It says, well, I'm going to examine this, this thing. Nothing happens. I'm going to examine this thing. Nothing happens. I'm going to examine this thing. It's like, oops, something is weird. Um, this is a, is a constraint that basically says, it says that uh, V10 plus V11 uh, naught is smaller than or equal to 1. But this is 1 already, because you see that uh, 11 is, is, is set to false. Minus 1 means false. 0 means it's unset. So it's minus, minus 1 means false. 11 is false, which means that V11 is 1. So what we have is, v10 plus 1 is smaller than or equal to 1. So I'm just going to cancel the two things out, which means that v10 is smaller than or equal to 0. But of course, it's not less than 0, because there's no such thing. So that means that v10 must be 0, right? There's no other way. So that's a propagation. That's a, that's a new fact that we, can, we, we know. And so we're going to say, OK, that's good. So we're going to propagate 10 to be 0. Right? N minus 10 is 10, is 10, 10 negated. Right? So 10 negated must be 1, which means that 10 is equal to 0. And the reason for this is that 11 has been set to, 
to false. So the reason close that is going to be is that uh, is I'm just going to read this thing out. I'm going to say minus v11 or v10. Or not v10. I know. How does this work? Yeah. Sorry. The other way around. Right. And that's it. So now we propagate it and we give this back to the, the, the solver. So we actually return this value to the solver, which means that one means it's a propagation, and here is a list of things that we propagate. And the list contains exactly one thing that we propagate. And this is actually the kind of hard thing. I want to maybe, instead of propagation, which is always much more complicated, what I will want you to do is conflicts. And you will see that there are some conflicts here. For example, here, 10 and 11 are both 0. And it's going to examine all the constraints. So this constraint is fine. This constraint is fine. Everything is fine. But here, we have a problem. Because if both of them are 0, that means that this con this, the value here is 2. You see that it's 2, but the right-hand side is 1. It actually prints the value. You see that it's going on. This thing, if I add it together, because both of them are, 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 are inverted, both of them are false, the two together add up to two, but this constraint says it's less than or equal to one. So there's a problem. So it says here is a conflict. So I'm just going to add everything that is part of this conflict into, into the conflict. And that is these two variables cannot be at the same time true, because otherwise this will not work. And this is what you have to uh, uh, implement. And then all I'm going to return is two, which means that I derive the conflict, comma, basically an empty list. It doesn't really matter at this point, easiest for you to return an empty list, because this could be a set of propagations, because you can propagate and conflict at the same time. But we're just going to say an empty list of propagations and the conflict that you derived. Right? So only thing you really have to deal with is this. All the rest, let's not deal for it for a moment. So there's propagations and conflicts, but let's just, con let's just like, concentrate on the conflicts. It's good enough if you concentrate on the conflicts. And these four constraints, of course, cannot possibly be satisfied. So eventually, it will find unsatisfiable. So that's what we're sort of aiming for. I can show you some interesting things uh, based, like, based on top of this. But let's just go for this. And let me show you the, um, the, uh, the code that I, that I have written up to do this so that you can sort of follow. So this is the, the set of coordinate constraints that were active last time. You see this is the coordinate constraints. So it's quite an easy Python. Oh, maybe it's not that large. Sorry about that. So this is the, um, the set of coordinate constraints. OK. I'm sorry. I mistyped. So this is the set of coordinate constraints that, were going, that, was, that was being run. I don't know if you remember. So this is the left-hand side, and this is the right-hand side. And at the top, you see the, the explanation of what it does, right? So this coordinate constraint says 1 times v10 plus 1 times v11 is smaller than or equal to 1, et cetera, et cetera. And here is like the same thing, but it's not, right? And what you do, we say, OK, well, the active set of coordinate constraints is this. If this one, you can see there are some other, side, other things that you can do if you want. And for debugging or whatever. And here we're going we're gonna to implement this Python function called propagate. And every time it's being called, you know, this thing says, hey, propagation is called. And this is the variable assignments. And it prints all the variable assignments, like you saw in the previous example. And I'm going to this, obviously, this is not implementing all the things you're supposed to implement, because it, all it's going to do is uh, return zero. So that basically says, nothing to do. Theory solver is happy. Of course, you need to add your lines of code here. Um, and if case you want to do a conflict, for example, then this is what you need to return, this kind of stuff, where you return two, indicating it's a conflict. You put this uh, bracket in there, because most likely it's not interesting to you. And then you put the reason. So this reason needs to be a list of literals that are all falsified under the current assignment, right? So this needs to be a conflict. There needs to be a reason to explain this conflict. And this needs to be, this, this needs to be um, a, a list of literals that are falsified. For example, you can return this. And if you turn this, then obviously the assignment for 1 and 2 must be minus 1, minus 1, and for 3 must be 1, because it means that 
uh, this uh, close is now falsified because this is zero, this is zero, and, and, and this is zero. So everything is zero, everything is falsified. This is a reason. It cannot be that one of them is, for example, the, it, this cannot be because then it's, it's not a conflict, right? Because then, then it's not falsified. And so let me run this thing just for a moment with, with uh, cause I already have of course the solution, but uh, here's one without the solution and it finds a satisfying assignment, which is of course impossible because that means that you didn't do the job, right? But anyway, um, let's not get into details. Uh, the, uh, this is what we were interested in. Um, this is the one that we have already seen and it finds an unsatisfi an unsatisfiable. And don't forget that this actually has a CNF input as well. You see this CNF input? So if you have a look at the, the CNF input, it's got some closes inside. It's got some stuff inside. And so it both eats, uh, this, this system will both use CNF, you know, just like a regular SAT solver, and it will use the CDCLT as well. So it will, it will run your, your cardinality constraints as well. And here's, your car and here's your cardinality constraints, and here is the place that you're supposed to implement returning a conflict like this when there is a conflict. So you're supposed to return, basically you're supposed to do something along the lines of for um, card in cards, and then say, well, I'm going to examine this. Right? So you have to examine this card and the constraint if it's okay, and if it's not okay, then return, you know, two comma this thing comma reason. Right? So that's it. That, that's what you're supposed to do. That's it. That's what you're supposed to do. Effectively examining all the card and constraints. Now, just let me explain to you how you do this. So what you need to do, so here, you go to crypto Minnesota on GitHub, and then um, if you go into the branch, then at the bottom of it, you'll see winter school. So you have to go to github.com slash msos slash crypto Minnesota. You can also just search for it. So if you search crypto Minnesota uh, GitHub, then the first thing, the first result is this. You click on it. And then here on the branch, you have to select winter school. I have to go to winter school. So this is winter school. You know that it's a winter school because you see at the top it says winter school. And then here in the readme, if you look, look down at the bottom of the readme, you will see there is CDCLT. And what you have to do is do this. So you create this file. It says create this file called a.cnf. So I'm going to do that. Here's my file. That's good. Then it tells you to create a the um, create a cdcl dot cdclt dot pi file. So I'm gonna do that. Um, I'm going to uh, take all of this. You're supposed to do the same, basically. Just copy paste this into a into the file, like that. So now we're good. It's all there. So this is the, uh, the thing, right? It's all there. And then it tells you that run this thing. You just copy paste it. And if you have installed Docker and you're on Win Linux, then this should work. If not, you just remove this part and it will work. All right, sorry. And then here it is. And you see that it's actually uh, telling me that uh, it called, it called all the things, but of course it didn't examine anything. So this, this Python file is missing, you know, not, it's missing what you want, basically. It's missing uh, the CDCLT part. Because it's not examining any of the, the cardinality constraints. So if you want to examine all the cardinality constraints, then you have to do something. For example, uh, we can go here and we say,
and we're going to say right hand side and we're supposed to examine these constraints if I understand correctly. And you see that it's supposed to now, you know, like examine this set of cardinal constraints. And it's your job to basically implement the checking and then returning something along the lines of what's in the file. So uh, you're supposed to return um, something like this when the cardinal constraint fails, when the cardinal constraint is, is falsified, when, when, it's not, when it's not being satisfied by the current assignment. And you always get the current assignment here. So the, uh, the current assignment is, is always printed, as you can see. So here's the current assignment here. And the current assignment just says one is set to true. And the next current assignment says one is set to true and 11 is set to minus one. And the next one, it says 11 is set to minus one and 10 is set to minus one. At this point, obviously, uh, this cardinal constraint is being falsified. This cardinal constraint is no longer valid, right? Because it says uh, 10, not 10 plus not 11 is less than 1. And that's not the case because not 10 plus not 11 is 2 here, actually. So you have to do something about it. And that's basically that's your job. So I will be obviously supporting you. And if you have any questions, you can come to me. But you need to navigate to this, to CryptoMinisat. You need to navigate to CryptoMinisat and then uh, check on branch, uh, you can find here Winter School, Winter School. You click on that branch, you get taken to that branch, and then at the bottom of it, you, will, you can search for CDCL, and you'll see that this, this is the one that you need to copy paste into a file called ACNF. You have to copy paste this thing here into a file called uh, CDCLT, and then you just need to run this command here. And every time you change your Python file, you just run this command again, and something will happen. As you could see, I mean, I could just edit the CDCL uh, Python file, and I don't know, say math is, I mean, an easy one would be say, saying, like, math is init finish. I save it, I run it again, and suddenly it will say math is init finish. So you see here. So you can change it, run it again, and run it again, and keep on running it until you get what you want. And hopefully the Satso will give you all the uh, errors that uh, <laughs> if you do something wrong, of course, the Satso should be detecting it. Because if you return something illegal, then you know, the Satso will be like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to do that. Uh, but I mean, error checking is always very difficult. People test, tend to uh, <laughs> push the limits of error checking. But if you return the right thing, it will do the right thing. If you, if you return the wrong thing, hopefully it will give you a, a meaningful message, you know, why why there's an error. So for example, if I do the CDCLT pi and you know, I don't adhere to the regulations and I return something like four, which I'm not supposed to, then hopefully it will tell you, don't do that. You know, like you're always not, you know, something is wrong. So you know, you're supposed to return here zero, for example, and then it will not complain. But of course the solution is wrong because this is not satisfiable. This is an unsatisfiable problem. So that's, uh, that's it. Um, download Docker. And then run this, uh, go to, um, to, this, uh, to this link, and then you can find some description of what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. Um, good luck. And I'll be sort of going around and try to help you, and then uh, at the end I'll show you the, the correct solution. Hopefully I can like, walk you through it. Um, uh, it's quite a lot of fun, I think. And also, like, obviously, you can in uh, increment, uh, implement anything into this, not just cardinality constraints. If you want to, you could actually do gauss jordan relation if you are into that sort of thing. But um, let's stick to cardinality constraints for a moment, and then obviously this can be reused for anything. Yeah, so good luck, and then let me know if you, had any, you need any help. Hi everyone, yes, so I think I'm just going to take the time to explain a little bit like the kind of solution that one solution that is possible to do this. Actually, I didn't also implement all the way everything that is possible. You will see my solution being partially incomplete. I hope you had a good time. Um, hands up if you actually managed to run it. Like I'm not, no, not in the sense of like doing the conflict or anything like that, but you actually managed to do the Python and uh, you know, run the Docker and it actually ran. Like you didn't have to solve the problem, but you actually managed to like play with it. That's actually quite a lot of people. So you all played with all this, 
Yeah, yeah I mean, you all, I, I saw quite a lot of you playing with it. So, I mean, I think that's, I would consider that already a success, actually, because usually it's very difficult to get everything right, and especially with, uh, with, uh, with C, C++ code, uh, it would have been, it would have taken you two, three hours just to get the compilation right. Uh, and you would have not had any chance of. So who actually managed to get an unsatisfiability at the end? I'm just curious. Ooh, actually quite a lot of people. Uh, wow, okay. <laughs> and I know that some people have attempted doing propagation as well, right? So who has managed to like attempt to do propagation? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, that's, that's very good. I think that's very good. Because propagation I think is very hard actually. I think it's very hard. Um, so I'm going to present one solution because there are multiple solutions to this problem and obviously some are faster and slower and whatnot. Just take into account, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but this is like when you run the Python program, you actually get a full set of assignments, right? So you all work the full set of assignments. And so you didn't have this thing that I was talking about with the state that you have to keep and the delta that you keep on getting, right? So you didn't get this delta like, hey, we assign a new variable, hey, we assign, unassign some variable. So you didn't do this delta every time you check the whole thing. So it's re relatively slow, but I mean, of course, this is significantly faster still than if you had to do, for example, Gaussian relation inside, like inside any SAT solver would be extremely slow, like it would never work. And with this, it would be kind of slow, like compared to something like CryptoMinisa that has it in C++, all the data and all the, the bells and the whistles, and you know, you always return a reason for every propagation, for example. Uh, and remember that CryptoMinisa does lazy propagation where you don't always return it, you just return a placeholder and then you compute it if you need to. But now you've got to understand you know, how this reason clause works and, 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 and how propagation, maybe you thought about how propagation could work as well. So I'm going to show you just one solution. I thought actually that, that it would to be harder, but I'm, I'm surprised how many people like, cracked it. You know? it's, it's very uh, satisfying to see, I have to say. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through uh, a solution. So here's one solution to the problem. Maybe it's going to be interesting to you, maybe it won't be. So the beginning is obviously the same as before. And uh, you know, I, I, I print all the, problem, all the things that I just reprinted together. And now uh, I'm going to see, go through every single cardinal constraint, you know, left-hand side, right-hand side. I'm going to always, I, I do quite a lot of printing. So I print like, hey, I'm examining this constraint that you know, whatever is less than whatever else. And then I say, well, you know, if the variable is assigned, then I'm going to find out if, you know, if it's negated or not, and I'm going to put only the falsified values into the reason. So I'm, I'm creating this reason here, okay? With all the falsified literals uh, in there. And now I'm going to check, okay, if it's um, unassigned, then potentially it could propagate this literal, right? So it's potential that, that this, there's a potential for us to propagate this literal. Not sure, but there's a potential for us to propagate it. And now we're going to calculate the current value of this cardinality constraint. So you remember that vol, the current value is, sorry, the current value is, is, is set to zero, and we're going to you know, keep on incrementing it. So if, if it is, then you know, like if it's positive, then we add that. If we're negative, we add that. So we update the current value, and now we know what is the value and what is the right-hand side, right? And we have the reason, the list of reason literals, right? So we have the reason literals here, and we have the potential things that we propagate. Notice that I only go through the, the literals once, right? And I calculate immediately the reason and the pro possibly propagating this. Actually, I've seen that in, uh, in, in some advanced implementations that some, I think, are <laughs> that I have seen. But uh, so this is, this is uh, one way of doing it. And then if it's larger than the, the right-hand side, then obviously something is off. And I'm going to say, OK, this is, this is a conflict. And I'm just going to return the reason, right? So this is the reason, and I return the reason. That's it. And if it is equal, right, now we're in this place, right? So the propagation is, is the following. I, I didn't explain this because I didn't even think anybody would get there, to be honest. I mean, I should have uh, had higher uh, hopes for all of you. Um, I, it took me longer than all of you to do it. So I think that should tell you quite a lot. Uh, Let's say that you know, it's something like a plus b plus c plus d is uh, smaller than or equal to 1. Okay? Actually, we can do something like smaller than or equal to 2. Okay? And we say a is equal to 1 and b is equal to 1. Well, that, what does this tell me? Well, it tells me that 
C and D must, must be zero. There's no way that they can be any other value, right? If, if C is one, then this is not gonna hold because then it's gonna be three, right? So this, this implies that C is zero and furthermore, it also means that D must be zero, right? So now I need to return two propagating clauses. One that says not C or uh, not A or not B and not D or not A or not B, right? And then the solver will take care of the rest. We say, okay, well, these are falsified, you know, these two are falsified and each of them imply these literals and things will move on. So this is what we want to do and that's, this is exactly what we will do. So here, if it's equal, then I'm gonna create, um, here are the propagating clauses, the, the propagating reasons. And I'm just gonna say, it. well, the propagating reason is the, the, liter, the potential literal that needs to be propagated plus the reason, right? So I mean, plus in this case is just appending or extending the, it's a, it's a Pythonism to uh, extend this list with the, uh, with the reason list. And then that's it. And we add this to the, to the list of propagations and then we return it. So here, we're good. And that's it, done. So it's, uh, I mean, it's relatively compact, of course. Uh, I had obviously more time and less pressure than for you to write it. But actually, if you think about it, it's super easy. Like it's, what, 40 lines of code with like probably 15 lines of comments. So not that difficult. And I think if anything you take away from here, um, if you take anything away from here is that, is that these theory systems are actually quite compact and quite easy to, uh, to write. And I think quite a lot of fun. And as you can, think, as you can see, you can ex express relatively complex constraints. Like at most K, at most K cardinality constraints, there are entire books written about how to do this thing. And you basically did it in four, like 10, 15 lines of code or maybe 20. So what I'm trying to say is that, of course, those books are written for a good reason. Then these people are not uh, wasting their time writing books for no good reason. But this is one way of doing it. And if you have very complicated constraints, then this can actually help you solve a problem that is that is made up of a large chunk of CNF and a small chunk of your complicated constraint. But you would need to do this more efficiently because currently, as you saw, you get the full assignment stack and normally what you would need to do is have a state and you keep on updating the state with the delta updates that you get from the solver. So instead of getting a full set of assignments, so you had this propagate assignments, right? So that was the trick. You had this full set of assignments here and that's not the case normally. What you would normally have is has, have a state and just set updates. Basically, you get a list of updates. And then you have to deal with it. And then you're back to the place where I was when I was talking, uh, where you have to have this relatively complicated state updates on your internal data structures to keep on like making sure that you are consistent and you're, you can always propagate and you can always conflict and you can do it fast because linearly going through all the constraints may be a little tricky, right? But I mean, here we only had four constraints, so it's not a big deal, but if you have like 10,000 constraints, then this is gonna be very, very expensive, as you might imagine. But sometimes all you need is one. So there are some uh, special cases where, you know, there's exactly one constraint that is really, really hard to express in CNF, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna express it in Python, you know, in a few lines of code, and then write everything else, all the other you know, 10,000 or million conf uh, constraints in CNF, and then make the two work together you know, in this kind of sandwich or back and forth, ping pong, whatever you wanna call it. And um, I mean, that sort of concludes it. I have a, Kudi wanted to show me some practical example of how this kind of stuff works. And I can go do something, but um, Give me a minute and then I'll show you this thing. So what this is going to do is basically uh, run our tool that Kulip and I have developed. Um, and 
the trick about this is that it's going to keep on adding tons and tons of XORs, and it will still work. So um, we run this thing. Uh, right, so this thing finished in 0 .0 .5 second, 0 0.05 seconds, and it gave me the number of solutions. And we do this by adding XORs, XOR constraints over the CNF on a, in a repeated fashion. And uh, running this without um, proper uh, XOR uh, reasoning, uh, let me try, I'll have to hack the hell out of this, but um, let's, let's, let's see if I can do this online. <laughs> not sure, but we'll, uh, we'll get there. Uh, I'm not horrible at it, but um, I'm always a bit uh, afraid when it comes to, to hacking uh, in front of everyone. But maybe it will, maybe it will work. Basically, I just showed you how it works when Gaussian relation is inside, and now I'm building without Gaussian relation. And obviously, this is supposed to be a ton slower. Actually, I don't think it will ever terminate, so my, my guess it will never actually finish. Uh, it would be very strange if it did, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, it's fine, it'll, it'll, it'll run. Let's see what happens. So, I actually don't need this. All right, so this is uh, obviously the, uh, the, the, the error that is like the idiot proof error because people will run this thing and will realize that nothing is working and then they will be very confused about it. And uh, it turns out that if you don't have that thing inside, then people are, you know, they, they still want to use it and okay. So that still works, but it's twice the time. Now, <laughs> let's see if we get something nicer. Uh, okay, this is a good one. So you see that it's struggling to do what it's supposed to be doing? I mean, now it's just there. Um, actually, let me see something a little uh, more interesting, maybe. Okay, slight issue. So now it's like super slow. You see that you have 32 XORs in there, and now it's dying. And now, if I build this with a uh, with, uh, Gaussian relation inside, so just remember, this is how far it went, and it was just struggling. So now, if I run it with Gaussian relation inside, you get this. Okay, we're at 128 at this point, in one-sixth the time. So, I mean, this will actually finish, I believe, but I, I don't really need to deal with it. Um, point is that the difference is... Uh, <laughs> quite big. I would like to see actually one that, that solves one way and doesn't solve the other way. So I'm just going to quickly do that. Ah, I want a good, good example that, that is kind of interesting one way or the other way. Okay, so now it's like 358 hashes active. You see that it took us 0 to 0.3 seconds. And without it, just one moment and I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. Because I know I'm keeping you longer than I should be. Right, so we went to 358 in 0 to 3 seconds, and now we're at 16 and we're stuck. Okay, 32 at 3 seconds, I think we're done. So it doesn't go any further. Uh, which is, I mean, the difference is, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna explain. Like this is, uh, the other one is 10 times, like 10 times more in one sixth of time, and this is completely stuck at this point. It will never get anywhere. It's exponential, so of course with 64, I don't think it will ever get to 64. So that's, like that's the divide. Once you have the CDSCLT in there, uh, you get this thing in, in milliseconds, and if you don't, this thing is just stuck uh, trying to do something that the other thing do. Then I mean, we got to 32, so here, here's, here we are at 32 in 0, 0 seconds, right? And this thing is at three seconds at this point, and I mean, it's stuck, right? So this will never get any further because 64 is exponentially larger, and this is twice, so, just, it will never get any further, that's it. So it's completely stuck. And if you actually implemented this thing that we did in, in Python, you know, into the Gaussian relation, just the same stuff that you did, it would actually continue, like it would actually run. Like it wouldn't be very, very fast, of course, because Python isn't that fast, but it would be much faster than this. Yeah, so that's it. Thanks for participating, it was quite a lot of fun, actually. Okay. So I always think uh, giving a, you know, day long tutorial about a tool that you work on is inviting someone to your house 
and if you invited someone, you know that that requires a lot of work in cleaning up your house and making sure it's presentable. Uh, Mate has been working on this, I'm aware, for last few weeks, so uh, we should really thank Mate for a really interesting five hour long tutorial about teaching a lot about the CDCL, CDCLT and all. Uh, Mate is going to be around for uh, tomorrow also, so I hope you'll get, uh, you'll find time to ask questions the rest of the time. So let's thank Mate once again.